and I'm going to talk about ruminant anatomy and specifically towards the beef industry because uh, Rock River Labs does a lot in the area of forage digestibility. I chose to focus this on forage, but I will be glad to address questions on grains as we go through. I'm going to tell you how I came up with this talk, basically. About 15 years ago, I was deer hunting with a group of farmers from southern Ohio. And I was working with a rumen microbiologist that was really interested in <coughs> rumen protozoa. And so every time we got a deer, I gutted it and immediately took a, a stirred up rumen sample for protozoa. And what I learned then was that when we give talks to people, most farmers have never seen the inside of one of their animals. That, that was my main thing. None of them had ever seen the inside of a rumen before. And several of these people who I was hunting with had small dairies, 80 to 100 cow dairies. And so, at that point in time, I switched the way that I teach ruminant nutrition and I teach beef production at Ohio State. But I've, I've switched the way that I used to do things, looking at charts, and just try to bring things down to the level of what I learned in rumen microbiology. Back in 1914, my PhD was actually looking <laughs> at the rumen microbiology of stressed ruminants, of feeder calves that had just been weaned. And so I, I care a lot about anatomy and physiology, but I just, I'm not going to show you a lot of data. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures and some data and just things to keep in mind when you're working on farms. Because I think we all look at feed samples and we have to keep two things in mind. Number one, when we're working with adding grain to forage diets, we talk a lot about in dairy on feed intake, but when we're in the beef industry and we're using those exact same diets to get the most efficiency, we talk about bunk management, about reducing acidosis by not keeping feed in front of an animal at all times. We also, when we're talking about grain and particle sizes of starch, we've got to remember that pH is a log scale. So going from a pH 7 to a pH 6, and a pH 6, there's 10 times more hydrogen ions in that room and at a pH 6 than at pH 7. And at a pH 5, which we get in, in a lot of diets, if we look at time, especially with finding the ground corn, if you do a pH of rumen contents an hour and a half to two hours after feeding, you can get a lot of pHs that are way below six. And a pH of five has a hundred times more hydrogen ions than a pH of seven, because it's 10 times 10. So having set that as a background, I'm gonna to try to run through relatively quickly ruminant anatomy and carbohydrate digestion. It's really, really important because we can't forget, and even though this is old data, that just harvested feeds for a beef cow operation, which is basically forage, are about 60% of total feed costs or total costs of that cow for a year. When I am giving this talk, I also want you to Shoot, the, the graph didn't really show up. That's never happened before. The peak, oh, here it is. It's really, really light. The peak nutrient requirements are from calving to breeding. Now, if we assume that these animals are calving roughly March 1, what we have to consider is that the peak time for nutrient requirements for this cow is occurring when we're feeding hay in a beef operation in this part of the world. So I am going to explain the four stages of production to beef cattle here, 
But between this period of time and the six weeks prior to calving, that's when colostrum is formed. So the efficiency of the offspring is set from a growth standpoint in beef in this last third of gestation, that's when those muscle cells are actually going through hyperplasia in the fetus and the number of nuclei in the skeletal muscle are being put down and that's being determined genetically during that last third of gestation. So all of these critical things for a beef animal are occurring during the last third of gestation and through breeding primarily in many parts where they're still on hay. This is the most important slide I'm going to show you today. It is the hierarchy of nutrient use, and it goes maintenance, development, growth, lactation, reproduction, and fattening. Every day, nutrients are used in this order. If you look at growth at coming behind lactation and these maintenance and development costs, the reason we have uh, Lactational lamb asterisk with high producing dairy cows a lot of time is because if you are not meeting their nutrient requirements and their feed intake cannot meet those requirements, especially with high producing dairy cows, they won't cycle. The same thing happens in beef cattle, but not necessarily because of high production. A lot of times it's because of poor nutrients, just poor feed. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today when we look at partitioning of energy, I'm not going to get down in here into the stuff that real smart people like St. Pierre and Weiss talk about. I'm not going to talk a lot about metabolizable energy. I'm not going to talk a lot about net energy because in the beef industry, ironically, we don't get enough digestible energy to even worry. We have so much fecal loss from fiber, and that's what I'm going to focus on, that we don't even need to worry about mega cows. I'm just going to talk about how do we get more of that fiber in a digestible form in the end. So a little bit of background. Rim bacteria are responsible for digesting feed. They digest feed by attaching to feed particles. And when we are dealing with forages, there's something called the lag phase. It ranges from an hour and a half to three hours that the bacteria take to attach. So if, here's a couple key things. They attach to a wetter feed faster than a dry feed because rumen bacteria are facultative anaerobes. If there is an oxygen molecule, a bubble of air on the surface of that forage, those bacteria can't Attach because that oxygen is slightly toxic to them. The other thing is they never attach to the outside of a forage. Why don't grasses dry out in the middle of the summer? Because the outside of forage has a waxy cuticle layer. Bacteria cannot attach to a wax. It's why we can't feed over 6% oil. Bacteria always digest forage from the inside of the forage to the outside of the forage. Never the reverse. So, if you are feeding a drier diet and you're feeding a really finely ground corn, I'm going back to the dairy example, by three hours, you may have a really, really low rumen pH after feeding because the bacteria that are digesting that forage are just starting to attach. But that starch has a lot of surface area and it doesn't have lignin. So we need to break down feeds by rate of digestion. And just while we're on this, I know labs look at periods of times greater than 24 hours. I don't. I only consider rate of digestion out to 24 hours. Because every day I have to get that cow or that steer to eat the same amount of feed that it did the day before. And so I'm looking at 24-hour digestion. Now you can argue, well, yeah, but they're still digesting feed out at 36 hours in the afternoon, and I can buy that. But for me, the most important thing is rate of 24 hours. Because even in the afternoon, what that steer or cow consumed the afternoon before needs to be gone. So I work on a 24-hour. 
So anything we can do to increase the surface area of the feed, like grinding, pelleting, grinding and pelleting, anything that increases the surface area increases the rate of digestion. This is a key thing, and I'll show you why in the next slide. The forage diets, they're about 1 to 3 billion bacteria per milliliter of rumen contents. And with grain diets, there are about 8 to 10 billion bacteria. So if I'm feeding corn silage, which on a dry matter basis is, if it's good corn silage, about half corn and, and half forage, I'm going to come somewhere in there of 4 to 6. It just follows the amount of area and the energy. We also have, oops, sorry, we also have protozoa that engulf bacteria. And one thing that's gotten a lot of attention that in the last 10 years that didn't used to are the Roman fungi. And I really think that from the standpoint of increasing forage digestibility, especially with dry haze, we need to pay attention to these fungi. And the reason is, this is just an electron micrograph. This thing that looks like a finger, that's a sporangium of a fungi. And these are Ruminococcus albus, they're, they're cellulose digesters. They attach to these fungi. These are Fibrobacter sussanogenes, they're a fiber digester. What happens with these rumen fungi is, they grow in to that forage particle in the rumen. Now I want you to think of a tree. The fungi are like the roots of a tree going down into the ground. They branch. The rumen fungi actually secrete enzymes that can break some of the lignin bonds. So they're the only organism that, create, that secretes an enzyme that can break that lignin hemicellulose bond. They break about half of them. But they carry the bacteria down into the forage. This is a picture of forage at zero hours, six hours, and 20 hours after being put in an in vitro system with bacteria. The digestion, just to show you visually, occurs from the inside to the out, not the outside to the in. One day I got bored and I started thinking, well, let's look at these number of bacteria. I got a forage diet and I have about 3 billion bacteria per milliliter. Or I have a grain diet and I've got about 8 to 10 billion bacteria per milliliter. Well, in my cattle, I've got about 15 gallons in the rumen. Well, if I've got a forage diet, I've got about 170 trillion bacteria in, a, in that rumen at any one time. If I've got a grain diet, I've got about 454 trillion bacteria. There's a reason I'm showing you this. The bacteria themselves provide 55 to 80 percent of the amino acids that are delivered to the small intestine that are used to meet the protein requirements of that animal. So what the concept I want you to get here is, in a feedlot diet, I very rarely have a problem with a deficiency of protein. As long as that diet's digestible and as long as I've formulated that feedlot diet for somewhere around 12 or 12 and a half percent protein, because there are so many bacteria per milliliter, I have pretty good protein supply to the small intestine. With a forage diet that has only about 40 to 50 percent digestibility versus a grain diet with about 95 percent digestibility, I've got a lot less bacteria. So if I want to improve the animal's protein status, I have to increase surface area of cellulose that's being blocked by lignin. I have to do things to increase the potential digestibility of that forage. It's one of the biggest problems that we have here in the eastern United States, even though compared to western forages, our forages have a lot more protein, what they have is they have a lot of lignin as well. And so I am very, very um, liberal on my protein supplementation to cows. Also have to remember that all protein in the rumen is broken down to ammonia before it's used by the bacteria. So I don't have a problem with urea in a beef cow diet. 
I don't have a problem with slow release urea. I love soybean meal. All soybean meal is a slow release urea on a forage diet because it's 80% available in the rumen. I love corn, I love uh, corn gluten feed in a beef cow diet on forage because it's 60% available in the rumen. I hate distillers grains on a forage diet because it's two thirds bypass. So it may provide some amino acids to the animal, but it's not going to provide ammonia to the rumen bacteria so that they can multiply and digest the forage. That's my main point. Okay. Now, rumen contents average 88% water, 12% dry matter in beef cattle. I'm not going to say the same things for those dairy cows that are eating a really, really high percent of body weight. Okay, when you start getting 40, 50 pounds of dry matter in an animal, this goes, I've seen rumen contents as high as 24% dry matter in some dairy cows. But in beef cows, where we're talking about 2 to 2.2% of body weight, the average is 12% water. Or, I'm sorry, 12% dry matter, 88% water. So I ask you a question. What happens if the pond is frozen? This is what I want you to start thinking about. Now, this is going to be a very down-to-earth talk. But I went to school because I grew up in Jefferson County. In Jefferson County, the houses are on the top of the hills because that never floods. And the ponds are on the bottom of the hills because of gravity. My job in high school and junior high was to take the spud bar out every morning before I caught the bus, go down to our two ponds, break the ice. It was a race to see whether I would die on the ice because the cows came running. Because if a cow is looking at ice and that water is open, they're going to drink five gallons at that time. They're going to drink another five in the afternoon. So let me ask you this. I've got a forage diet that's dry, it's hay. It takes an hour and a half to three hours for that lag phase for the bacteria to attach. And then in many beef situations where the water that they're drinking is not warmed and they drink once or twice a day, they're putting five gallons of something that might be 34, 35 degrees in to a system that they have to bring it up to 101 and a half. Bacteria don't divide and they don't digest feed when that room is 95 degrees. They work at 101. They don't work at all at 80. So I ask you, how many hours a day do we lose in beef cow production by not giving water that's in the 40s or low 50s? It's a tremendous amount. We don't have that problem in many feedlots because we have to keep those automatic waterers running and that water's turning over. You take the water, even in like a richy type of water, it's still going to be in the 40s because it's constantly coming in there. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Another thing. Every one pound of dry matter requires seven pounds of water. That's what 12% dry matter, 88% water works out to. So, if I have cows and the dry matter intake is really low, Maybe it's because of water. I have been in feedlots that have done expansions, and one of the biggest things I check with cattle feedlots is stray voltage. Take a voltage meter with you and put it on the water cup in a feedlot if cattle aren't gaining. We're not talking large amounts of voltage. Just a very small amount of stray voltage will keep cattle from drinking. They will only go there when they absolutely have to. I told you, this is brought down a lot from Bill's talk. I ask Bill all the science questions, okay, just so we're clear here. So, we have a lot of things that impact the rate of digestion then. How finely ground is the, the forage? How wet is the forage? Is the water at an appropriate temperature? We're trying to get maximum production. What happens in a drought? If you don't have water development, where do cows stand? in a drought, in the pond. There's something called total dissolved solids. Look at the water in a pond the next time you're on a farm in the middle of the summer and it's really, really hot and the cows are in there. See if you can find some clear water or if those cows are drinking muddy water. 
The problem is something called total dissolved solids. The inside of that rumen is filled with papillae that are responsible for taking those VFAs and absorbing them into the bloodstream. If those papillae are covered with mud, absorption goes way, way down. Total dissolved solids, more than 5,000 parts per million, should not be used for pregnant or lactating cows. And when you get above about 7,000 parts per million, you can kill cows for nothing other than water with high level of total dissolved solids. This isn't necessarily a heavy metal problem. It's screwing up the inside of the rumen problem. These are a picture of relatively healthy papillae. They ought to be about three quarters of an inch long. This is from the bottom of the rumen. This is the reticulum, also tripe. If you're ever in France and you want a delicacy, I advise you to eat tripe. That's what this is. I've never had it. I'm advising you because I want someone to come back and tell me what it tastes like. Okay? I can never get past that. It's kind of like I used to love liver and onions too, and then I took a 700 level biochemistry class, and I haven't been able to eat them in 34 years. Okay? This is really important though because look at the size of particle that gets trapped, about the size of a particle of corn. You don't go out even on a beef farm and look at a pile of manure and see forage particles three inches long. They've got to break it down in order to eat more. So my question to you is, how much energy does it take to get this down to this in a rumen? What's the particle length in a dairy? People are very picky on particle length in dairies, but they're not in beef operations. The best piece of equipment to me that's come out in the last 10 years are chop cut balers. I did a, in my second year of a study that we're doing down at the Jackson Research Center looking at cows in mid to late gestation. Only differences, only difference is using a right hair round baler or a chop cut baler that takes it down to about five inches before it goes out into the feeding pad. The cows that were on chop cut hay last year gave gain 22% more they, than cows that were on long stem hay. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a second. But I'm going to make you sit through three minutes of chemistry. I'm not going to go over three because I learned chemistry one minute took me one semester. I only took three semesters of chemistry, so you're getting a three minute talk. This is glucose, the sugar glucose. This is starch. This is cellulose. The only difference between starch that has an alpha linkage and cellulose that has a beta linkage is how these are linked. What I want to tell you is we worry about cost to feed. We worry about feed particle size. To the rumen bacteria, they either look at these kind of linkages or these kind of linkages. And if you've got a cow that has never ever seen grain on a farm that has never seen grain, only 12 to 15 percent of her total bacteria are cellulose digesters. Because all those cellulose digesters do is they, they cleave these long chains of glucose and this would go on for about 10,000 more glucose units and branch up and down. They break them down into smaller sections. The majority of the bacteria in the rumen use either one, two, or three glucose units. If you've got an animal on the other side that's in a feedlot, only 12 to 15 percent of the bacteria in that rumen are pure starch digesters. They break them down into one, two, or three glucose units. It's an amazing system because we have a lot of flexibility of what we can feed. Now, I'm never going to tell you to do this in practice, but I took 240 newly weaned calves about 25 years ago, brought them into our research feedlot down here in Worcester, and started them day one, not creep fed, on a 100% grain diet. 
I managed the amount of calories that I gave them. And I brought them up on feed very, very slowly with whole shell corn. And over that 28 day period, I did not have a bloat death. I did not have any obvious acidosis. They gained over four pounds a day. Their efficiency was around 4.2 pounds of feed per pound a gain. What I'm telling you is that when we make recommendations on the farm, we make very conservative recommendations because those people don't weigh out everything precisely. But my message to you is the system has a lot of flexibility. If we don't give too fine a particle size and we control the amount of calories that an animal is given, we have a lot of flexibility. This is another important slide. And it, I'll show you. If I have a 100% forage diet, I want you to turn around and look at the laughter in the back of the room. Jeff McCutcheon, who did his PhD with me, and my daughter are back there going, my God, he's breathless. He's trying not to run over. Ha, I'm on time for me. <laughs> if I have 100% forage diet, that animal in that room, it's going to produce about 70% acetate and about 16% propranate. If I go to a 20% forage, 80% grain diet, acetate's about 50%, propranate just about doubles. Folks, this, this little graph here, this is why we feed grain in feedlots. Because propranate just about doubles. Because what happens with that is acetate only goes for subcutaneous fat, seam fat, and milk fat. 